Mm-hmm. My first question is, why is effective political and civilian control of the military essential to democracy? Well, I think that's, I mean, I think that's pretty well covered. It's part of, a, it's sort of a key principle in American political life. Um, and I don't think it was really too much of an issue in, in Hungary when the change of systems. I should add that actually the more important period for me for your discussions here was when I was the political chief in the embassy from 1990 to 1993. So uh, I arrived, it was a very exciting time. The first weekend I was there was the vote of the referendum on how the president was going to be elected. Uh, a week later, Arpad Kuntz was elected by par- parliament to be the president. And only two or three days after that, we had the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. So um, as terms of of uh, uh, civilian control of the military, and I can get into that a little bit more uh, in, in the discussion, but um, it, it's so basic to a democracy. I mean, the very term democracy means that the people decide, the people elect their civilian leaders, military leaders are not elected, uh, and the uh, it's clear that everyone who works in the government, whether military or civilian, responds to the political leadership and the policies that they want to follow. And I think that's been pretty well uh, uh, adhered to in uh, American political life. And I think one of the ironies is is that in the Rensera Valtash, the, the transition uh, in the late 80s into the early 90s, because of the Hungarian military had communist rulers, and the Communist Party was, after all, the uh, the political power. There was no question that the military responded to the party because it was all, even though it was not a democracy as we understand it, um, they responded to the, the political leadership. So, uh, and in my time in Hungary, both 1993 and 98 to 2001, I don't remember there ever being a um, a big issue about that. So, um, but let me go back to uh, to 1990. Uh, to uh, I'm sorry, 1990 when I arrived. Um, that was at the end of July, so at the beginning of the Uborka season, mm-hmm. and it was amazing that from one day to the next, we were going in to the Hungarian Foreign Ministry and the Hungarian uh, Ministry of what was it called Economic Cooperation, but we were. We were working with our Hungarians to see whether they would join us in the coalition to push Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis out of Kuwait, and there was really never any question about it. One of the most, one of the things I remember very clearly was going in to see Ferenc Shomoji, who at that time was a deputy foreign minister under Horn, and to talk to him with the ambassador uh, Charlie Thomas about. Um, what Hungary might be prepared to do. And he told the story about the, if you will, the butchery of Saddam Hussein and the Hungarian experience with him. He, he talked about how Hussein had come to Hungary at some point in the late 70s or 80s. And as the Communist Party often would, uh, they'd take him on a hunting trip. And so they're hunting wild boar in the forest and they came across a, uh, a wild boar that was feeding her piglets. And Saddam Hussein lifted his gun to his shoulder and shot this mother boar. And for the Hungarians, it was such a shock, but it really sort of taught them about the brutality. I remember that story because it sort of captured the uh, uh, what it was we were going up against. And of course, the history of Hungarian-American cooperation and, uh, during that first Gulf War was, was pretty impressive. It was less than a year later, in June, after the war had been won, that we celebrated the Hungarian medical contingent that had been in the Gulf to provide uh, uh, medical care as needed for uh, the Allies. And if you recall, President Bush had uh, had, uh, I forget how many countries were involved in the effort to push Saddam out. But there had been a Scud attack uh, on in, uh, where was it? I forget exactly where it was, but in Saudi Arabia where some of our troops were stationed and some of our troops had been 
uh, hit by the Scud attack, and it was the Hungarian doctors there who actually came to their relief and saved, in, in a couple of cases, some lives. So we were celebrating this. As it turned out, it's in 1991, the summer of 91, again, turned out to be Chargé, because the ambassador was back in Washington, and the number two was on vacation. <clears throat> and um, it really was a, a was a impressive moment. Um, so, you know, then in terms of civilian control, if there was a time when the military might have thought about uh, taking some steps, um, but they didn't, uh, was in the taxi strike. And I think that was 90 or 91, um, when the, you know, uh, taxis had blocked all the bridges. And so commerce within Buda, between Buda and Pest, had basically stopped. The only way you could get around was by the subway, by the metro. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, that was resolved, but it was a, a real challenge. It was a, a moment of challenge to the, the young Hungarian democracy. <clears throat> but I don't think there was ever any discussion. Well, I'm sure there was discussion. But there was never any move to actually involve the military, in my recollection, to solve, solve the crisis. And if it had been done, it would have been done at the guidance of uh, Prime Minister Antal and the Interior Minister at the time. I remember being in the office of Imre Konya, who was the MDF uh, fraction, you know, fraxio visitor or whatever the expression was. Um, and while this was going on, and he was uh, quite frustrated and, and, and quite worried about what might, what might happen, but was never really any discussion of the military coming in and, and upsetting the apple cart, as it was. Um, so that, you know, those were sort of some highlights of those, those three years. I've made some notes here. Um, oh, in 1992, as I, I mentioned to Ambassador Jarmati, um, of course, we were all very much uh, uh, concerned about the war in Yugoslavia, and, um, and Hungary, because of its, its position on the border, was especially concerned because there was a large, as you all know, a large Hungarian minority in Serbia, in the Vajdušak. And um, uh, there was actually uh, uh, Serbian uh, planes were dropping bombs, uh, cluster bombs, actually, in, in Hungary, by mistake, to be sure. But it, it sort of emphasized how, how uh, nervous everybody was about the situation. Um, and of course, that was not that situation was not to be resolved until, uh, well, until Dayton, you know, three or four years later. But in 1992, for the first time ever, um, General Powell, Colin Powell, who was our chairman of the Joint Chiefs, our Chad, came to Hungary for an official visit, and he met then with General Lorenz and, of course, most of the political leaders, and. Um, um, you have to remember that after the first Gulf War, the U.S. military had decided, and now the wall had come down in, in East Germany, the Soviet Union had broken up, so there was a sense that we didn't need the, the defense budgets in the United States um, that we'd had during the Cold War. So we were, we were downsizing our military, and General Powell had been very much involved in that. So in his meetings with uh, uh, Lorenz and the uh, uh, Hungarian leadership there, and, and, and Minister Führer, Defense Minister Führer, there was a lot of discussion about uh, IMET, uh, training we could do for the Hungarians, uh, eventually foreign military sales. It was that, that year we had the first foreign military sale going on with a former Warsaw Pact country. I mean, the Warsaw Pact had only broken up the year before in 1991, so it was a, a pretty eventful thing. And I found this quote in my notes from Powell that last day as he was finishing up with, um, with uh, General Lorenz. And um, he said, I have lots of experience in this area talking about dealing with parliament and the political pressures because, of course, now it was happening in this parliament Hungarian military leaders, as happens to American militaries, were being called before Parliament to testify. 
and Powell was saying, I have lots of experience in the area. I'm the biggest expert in the world. It's not always pleasant. I tell our students and our military officers that why, why is, when they ask, why is there so much noise? I, them, I tell them that noise has a name, democracy. And the only, demo, only solution to democracy is more democracy which it is important that military officers understand that we're completely subservient to our civilian leaders. Um, and he said, I'm enormously pleased to see how quickly the Hungarian armed forces have adjusted to, to, to the need to remove the political, in, this, in the sense of, of the Communist Party leadership, from the military, and efforts to give um, uh, 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 sort of rules in place on how to work with uh, with society. Rule of law is essential to establishing relations um, uh, in our countries. Anyway, and then more and more discussion about where some of the cuts that uh, Powell had been instrumental in making. So, um, so that was um, that was a very interesting period. Uh, I left in 1993, the summer of 93. Of course, Bosnia was still very much an issue for all of us. Um, and uh, Prime Minister Antal was still Prime Minister. We were very involved with trying to help uh, him in his treatment for his cancer at the time. Um, we were in, in contact with uh, our doctors, cancer experts in the United States who would consult, and when an Antal came to the United States, he actually met with some of our doctors. But as you all know, in, in the winter of 93, of course, he died, and Prime Minister Boros uh, took over. Um, so I was gone. Uh, it was a very exciting time. 94, 95, in the United States, people started talking more seriously about NATO expansion. Um, and of course, that was all to come to be. When I came back as DCM, in April of 98. The reason I came back at that time was because Hungary was on the brink of joining NATO together with the Czech Republic and, and Poland. And I arrived on a Friday, uh, or maybe it was a Thursday, and the next day my old friend who was our ambassador to NATO, uh, Sandy Virchbau, arrived with his wife and we did the rounds of the Hungarian political establishment, as, as well as I'm sure some in the military, uh, in preparation for this transition to uh, NATO membership, which took place uh, within weeks of that. Um, and of course, it was one of the, the ironies of, of that period that um, because uh, they joined NATO in 98, and within months of that, we were dealing with the problem of Kosovo, and um, and so here was Hungary again, uh, essentially at war with its neighbor Serbia, Yugoslavia, and um, so I think there were a lot of Hungarians who questioned the you know what being a member of NATO was, but of course being a member of NATO always meant not only that we were a collective security organization, all of us countries together, but that um, um, uh, that that meant that you also had to contribute in a serious way. And of course, that's become a political issue these days. Anyway, I know you have other questions, so I'll stop there. Okay, what are the essential elements of the civilian control and what does it mean institutionally and in substance? Well, you know, I think that's all, I think that will be covered. You can get a, any political science, scientist to sort of tell you about that as a practitioner. For me, it's, it basically means that uh, the military responds to to requests for information, requests for intelligence, requests for um, advice, planning, a strategic view, tactical uh, steps to fulfill that strategy, and that when the civilian leadership makes those decisions, um, they abide by them and they fulfill them to best they can, um, and. Um, you know, institutionally, it means, of course, that the military is subservient to the political government. But in a democracy, a parliamentary system, oops, sorry, let me turn this off. Okay. Sorry, I should have done this before. 
Okay, now you switch back <laughs> on. Sorry. Um, so anyhow, yeah. Okay. So anyway, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear, and you'll have others who can uh, from the military. You probably already had people from our military who uh, can sort of wrap that up as well. So I'll, you know, I'll stop with that. Okay. Um, what do you think of the process of the establishment of political and civilian control of the Hungarian military after the regime change in 1989? Well, I think I've, I've covered that to a certain extent in my description of sort of the relationships we had with the military. Um, I can say that there was never any question in my mind that, um, you know, that the, the Hungarian military was not in sync with uh, the civilian government. I'm sure amongst themselves, especially those who had served under the, uh, the you know, Hungarian Socialist Workers Party, the Communist Party, that they, like all military, they may have had some questions or scratched their heads about some of the things going on politically as civilian leadership. But I never had any sense at all that there was any challenging to the basic principle of civilian control of the military. And I think, you know, uh, certainly during my time there in the, in the early 90s, and then later on in, when, when uh, Prime Minister Orban came to power in 98. Okay. What was your experience when you first confronted to this issue in what capacity and how long and what capacities did you deal with it? Well, um, I think as an American, even as a uh, high school student and talking about uh, American government, these were principles that were always uh, uh, laid out there. Um, I don't know to what extent uh, you know, that was true in Hungarian schools, and of course the subservience of the military would have been to the Hungarian Socialist Workers Party, the Communist Party. Um, but the, you know, and the effect of, the practice of course is different when you've entered democracy, because every four years or every eight years you have a change in the federal federal government, the president changes and, and then his, uh, his ministers do. So um, I don't think, you know, and then of course, as a foreign service officer starting in 1982, that was uh, always, uh, an, an, uh, you know, a principle that we all understood. Now, since I spent so much time in, in Eastern Europe, especially in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, there was an understanding again that the military was, was part of the, uh, was part of the government, um, but subservient to the Communist Party. And the only time I can think of, even in Soviet history, when uh, someone might have raised a question about this was in the transition after Stalin died in 1953 and Marshal Zhukov actually played a role in the uh, getting uh, different political people into a, different, into a place where decisions could be made to put in a new anti-Stalinist leadership. But, you know, that was hardly... Uh, uh, a, a military coup by any, sta by any standards. So, yeah, it, you know, as I say, this was sort of a principle in our lives. And as a foreign service officer, I don't think there are probably too many political or economic officers uh, who, who don't certainly see that as kind of the core, core principle of, of uh, the lives we lead. Thank you. I would like to ask you what exactly was your job in supporting in this process? Well, in the early 90s, um, because a couple of times I ended up being uh, the charge or the acting DCM, um, with the, um, I was active in getting the first foreign military sales uh, deal completed. Um, uh, now, of course, um, that's just sort of the, the detail of the, of the, Political military relationship that was was growing between our two countries, um, but that was a very significant event and was seen both in Washington and in Hungary as a, a feather in the cap of of the hung Hungarian democracy that um, you know that that we would entrust uh, sophisticated military equipment to the Hungarian military and of course in a way it was just a first step to what eventually 
in the mid 90s would become the drive for uh, NATO membership. So, um, uh, you know, and then of course the, the work I did in the early 90s when the uh, when we got the Hungarians into the effort against uh, Iraq and Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War, which was incredible. I mean, who would have believed? Now, that said, even though that all went forward, Hungary was still in the Warsaw Pact until, uh, I mean, the Soviet troops didn't leave Budapest until June of 1991, when I, ironically, was chargé again, which was very interesting because, of course, it was a great day of triumph for the Hungarians when the Soviet soldiers left in June of 91, and there were great celebrations, and we and the other NATO ambassadors agreed that we would sort of downplay this because we didn't want to rub, as it were, rub the Soviets' no no noses in the fact that, you know, they were out and, and NATO was on top, as it were. Um, so we were very, uh, very um, careful about how we, we dealt with that as a public diplomacy thing. Uh, but that was another, you know, sort of political military thing uh, that, that, uh, that I was involved in, that we were involved in. Um, I do remember they had uh, in Gödel a big celebration with the performance of Istvan Akirai, um, which was, of course, really a celebration of Hung Hungary's independence with the last Soviet troops gone. And I did go to that, sort of low level. There wasn't a big political thing, but it was uh, quite an enjoyable uh, event, uh, clearly. So uh, let's see, my last three years as DCM, of course, the issue at that time was, was Kosovo. Um, we had a, the relationship had, had changed qualitatively. Um, you're going to see one of the generals who was involved with uh, uh, the prov provision of a lot of uh, assistance to the Hungarian military. Colonel Sergi, have you interviewed C Colonel Sergi? Okay. Uh, Colonel Sergi, of course, who had been the defense attaché when I arrived in April of 98. And a month later, I got to host his farewell as an attaché. Two months later, he was back as a special advisor to the Hungarian military, working in the Ministry of Defense. So the whole nature of the relationship had changed. Hungary was now a NATO member, fully, fully uh, integrated uh, at Brussels into the NATO structure. Um, and so it was a matter of doing the same kinds of things uh, that, uh, uh, that we do with other NATO countries, whether, well, especially new NATO countries, that we were doing in the Czech Republic, in Poland. Um, I should say that early on in, I believe it was already in the early 90s when I was there, we established a relationship with the National Guard in Ohio with Hungary. So an awful lot of the training that was going on was being done by the Ohio National Guard um, with Hungarian military. And this was going on all the time. So as you talk, you've talked to Colonel Martinson, who was, was also a Foreign Service officer, also served in Hungary as a Foreign Service officer, so he has a, a great perspective on this. Uh, you're gonna talk to General Reno, you've talked to Colonel Sergi. Um, it's too bad we can't find Ruth Anderson, who was the defense attache during the transition from uh, 88 to, to uh, 91, um, but there was a lot going on. So in terms of the military uh, civilian relationship, um, the relationships were so strong between the Hungarian and the American uh, military. And of course, as I said before, the principle of civilian control was never in question, um, uh, certainly for us and I believe for the Hungarian military as well. And so it was a very, you know, it was a very positive time. That said, um, one of the very interesting things that happened during that period, and I think it was, we started this in 99, um, Ambassador Tufo, uh, there was a discussion going on at NATO about the um, Hungarian MiGs, which you had had for a long time. And uh, uh, the Hungarian military, Hungarian government, wanted to upgrade them, modernize them. And Ambassador Tufo, and this is one of his, I think, great moments, uh, challenged both 
NATO, both our representation at NATO, as well as the Hungarian government, saying, well, why, why are you upgrading these old Russian jets? You're now members of NATO. You ought to be thinking about serious American uh, uh, airplanes. And so we had the whole discussion about the, um, the F-16s, F-16s it was, and, um, and this really changed the whole dynamic. Um, Prime Minister Orban started to look at this. There was put a contract out, Lockheed and, the, and Gripen, the Swedish company, and the Brits were involved because they built the engines for the Gripen. And um, right up until the day I left in 2001, August 2001, and I had had, had meetings with the Prime Minister, with uh, the uh, National Security Advisors, obviously with the ministries about this, and uh, General Fodor, who was your chad at the time, I remember telling me uh, not long, well, it was actually a year or two later, that in fact, as they went into the weekend before the decision, two weeks after I'd left, that he fully believed that uh, the, the U.S. plane was going to get the nod. And in fact, the prime minister chose the Gripen, which um, was a great shock, especially after all the uh, cooperation we had had with Hungary and the sort of selling point we always said, well, when you, when you buy American, you also get the American support uh, behind it. So in terms of support for the planes. And um, uh, that, of course, was, uh, you know, sort of a blip on the screen uh, uh, that in terms of the U.S.-Hungarian relationship was, uh, was not great. It was, that happened 19 years ago. No, 18 years ago today, 2001, September 10th, 2001. We know what happened on September 11th, 2001. And um, because of what happened on 9-11, on and I was working at the National Security Council for President Bush doing Russia. Russia was my responsibility. But I was in the European uh, directorate there. Uh, when you get Kurt Volker, he, Kurt was also there working on NATO questions at the same time I was there. Um, and. Um, uh, the aftermath, if you go through the Hungarian newspapers, Mr. Chorka, who was always a, a burr in the behinds of us as well as the Hungarian government, because his far-right views were always tainting uh, the relationship in a negative way. And he and some others on the far right had come out with this line that some Americans had come out with as well, that the United States had really brought 9-11 on itself. And the fact that Prime Minister Orban at that time was not willing to go out and condemn strongly what he said affected the relationship um, uh, between the, the decision of, uh, about the F-16s, uh, uh, not contradicting uh, uh, Churka, and then there were, of course, the relations with defense of the Hungarian minority, especially in Romania, that had, uh, uh, had caused some concern on our side. And um, uh, I know that Prime Minister Orban was not happy with the ultimate decision not long before the elections in 2002 uh, that uh, President Bush would not agree to meet with him, but we thought it was politically, just before an election, it was not appropriate to do that. Um, but I think that uh, uh, these other things that had come up had also affected the, uh, that decision. So, you know, that's sort of it in terms of my relationships with Hungary. Um, uh, I got to Hungary several times when I was ambassador to Slovenia. Uh, as you know, Slovenia has a large, not a large, but has a Hungarian minority in the eastern part of the country that uh, uh, I actually was was impressed and, and happy to find out that that minority maintains their 
their modern elf and they uh, when I went out there, I had did interviews in Hungarian as well as in English and Slovenian, so it was kind of fun. But I didn't really have much to do uh, after that with uh, with Hungarian affairs, Hungarian U.S. Hungarian affairs. So that was pretty much it. I would like to ask you, uh, what were the most difficult problems you had to confront in this issue, and how you managed it? Well. I think the most difficult issue um, in the political military relationship that I was directly involved with was the decision about the uh, the planes. And we had been working on it um, for a year and a half since since uh, Ambassador Tufo had successfully challenged the NATO decision to have uh, the NATO and Hungarian decision to have the, the MiGs upgraded. Um, and we had sent in Uh, you know uh, the, the uh, industrial representatives to push this. We had the same thing going on at Poland in Poland at the same time, and um, uh, it was not difficult. We were pushing on an open door. Both our political, and when I say political, I mean from Prime Minister Orban on down. You know, Ambassador Semerkani, who was working for him then as a, a national security advisor. Um, Andras Kirai uh, was there, um, this is in, in 2001, um, and I mentioned uh, Lajos uh, Fodor, or um, General Fodor. General Fodor, I think, believed, and after their examinations of the planes, uh, wanted to buy American. So that was, I mean, this is not really, I mean, the interesting thing is it sort of proves the point about civilian control of the military. Um, if General Fodor had, had his way, I imagine he would have gone with the American plane. Um, but it was a political decision. It was made by the prime minister in consultation with his ministers uh, to to get the Gripen. And that shows that, in, in fact, you know, civilian control certainly worked in this, this, in this, at this period, although I think um, Most Hungarians in the government, uh, I'm sure this was sort of a card that uh, Prime Minister Orban had been planning on, on perhaps playing for some time before that. But until the last day, nobody, nobody was really aware of it. So that wasn't, um, you know, that wasn't really a, a problem in the Churka issue, which of course would raised its ugly head uh, early in my first tour. Uh, 92, 93, that did not affect the civilian military relationship in any way, nor did it in the last three years I was there as well. So um, that was the only, uh, the decision about the planes was the only one that uh, was a difficult one for us. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't, if anything, it, it makes clear the point that there's civilian control of the military in Hungary. I have one more question to you. Uh, what do you know of the current situation in Hungary? Well, in terms of civilian control and the military, I really have I'm I am not up to up to snuff at all. I'm sure many of the uh, people you're talking to follow it more closely. Um, so that's that's all I can really say. I mean, in, in terms of I mean, we've had. We've had concerns in the U.S. government that, of course, have been in the newspapers about the current government's uh, decisions they've made over the last several years about um, uh, the selection of justices, uh, control of the media, things like that. But those really don't uh, enter in on in terms of civilian control of the military. Um, but they do raise questions about the state of democracy in, in Hungary. And those are, of course, debates that will continue. Um, but of course, we have our own issues in this country now that uh, that uh, almost that dwarf some of those discussions in Hungary, sadly.